Hey guys, Mike here. Thanks for watching. Today's job's kind of unique. We got a house floor here. We're pouring the basement floor. And then up top, you can't really see it too good from here, but there's a garage floor up there, a two car garage. We'll be pouring along with it. And then off to the side, towards the end of the video, you're going to see us pour a little generator pad for this. We live in Maine. A lot of, a lot of people have uh, propane uh, standalone generators here just in case the power goes out for an extended period of time. And that's what these people are going to do eventually. They'll just put one of those generators on that pad. But right now, we're going to pour this walkout basement. We're going to match top of wall here where the wall is real low. And what you see in the floor is they've got two inches of styrofoam down. That white tubing is for radiant heat, so they'll run hot water through those tubes. It'll heat the slab, and that's going to end up heating the house. We, there's a lot of floors that we pour in Maine that have the styrofoam with the radiant heat in them just like this. We, we do them every week. Um, so people will not only do this, but then they'll put in a... Uh, you know air conditioning so they're like a heat pump for AC and just like as a backup heat source also but we do you know do you guys do you guys do a lot of floors with radiant heat in them to heat the house let me know down in the comments and if you do do you do it very similar to this so there's a couple ways the guys install the radiant heat tubes they'll staple them to the styrofoam like this or they'll lay down the wire mesh and then they'll tie the tubing right to the wire mesh and that keeps it good and tight. Those, those are the two most popular ways here. What you see in the middle there where there's no styrofoam is that's just basically a, you know, a concrete footing for, the, for his lolly column so he'll have a center beam in the house and that's what most of the weight of the middle of the house will be sitting on. And that's pretty common too with floors here in Maine. Um, guys when they do the footings they'll do those what we call lolly column pads. Some guys will just do the individual pad itself about two by two and then some guys, foundation guys, will just do a big strip down the middle like like the one you see here. And we're getting, we're just you know pouring the floor like we normally do. We're hired as a sub on this one. The guys that did the concrete walls hire us to do their floors. So we'll come in, we'll pour and finish and saw cut and that's basically just charging them for labor here. We charge the concrete right to the foundation guys. This is our regular floor mix, so we're pouring a 3500 PSI floor mix, fiber mesh in it for reinforcement. Uh, we got we got a mid-range water reducer so we can pour around six and a half, seven inch slump without without bothering the strength at all. And just a little bit of air entrainment. That we get we that's our little chute, that six foot chute we put on the end of the truck chute. So that kind of helps save us from, uh, you know, as far as access goes, it, it could save us from getting the conveyor truck or it could save you. We got, we got longer ones too, like a 16 footer. It could save you from getting a pump truck. I don't know but what they charge you guys for pump trucks in your area, but if we get a boom pump, it's probably around twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 just to get the pump on site. We'll use those shoots whenever we can just to try to save the people a little bit of money. If you don't mind pulling the concrete a little bit like that, if we got to pull it you know six to ten feet that's not a big deal with the slumps that we pour. That's another reason we use the water reducer in the concrete too so we can we can pull the concrete a little bit if we have to and uh, it just makes our, our life a little bit easier. That's another thing that's handy about that little six foot chute and just redirect it if that makes your life a little bit easier so that's what we do a lot. We got three trucks showing up here today. You can see the second one showing up up top and then the third one will finish the job. I believe it was around 25 yards to do the whole thing. All that plumbing you see in there, there's going to be a bathroom down there, there'll be a kitchen down there. You know, this will, this will be one of the main floors of the house, and then they'll have an, an upper floor that's even with the top of that, that high wall, that eight foot wall. And I believe they have a need of even another room up top, so there'll be three stories to the house. The lot was a little tough as far as access goes, I mean, the the backfill when the guys backfilled they 
they did a good job backfilling, but the stuff they used, they didn't really roll it hard, so it's kind of soft to back a concrete truck down there. As you'll see here coming up shortly, uh, I mean, because of the slope of the land, getting the truck down to where we needed it wasn't that big a deal, but getting them out is because of the gravel was kind of soft. And you'll see what I mean here in a minute by that. We've got some spectators watching us today too. Uh, the owners, the owners uh, are here watching. I think, if I remember right, they wanted to put their handprints in the concrete after we got done, and you know, put the date in the concrete. We have a lot of people that like to do that stuff. So Luke and Eric are right there in the blue and the brown shirt. They're kind of raking the concrete around, getting it spread out. I was making a pad you with the laser and Darren back there in the white he's magging the edges smooth according to a chalk line we have snapped around the perimeter where that where that grayish styrofoam is and that's what we'll go by back there when we start screeding here in a minute I'm trying to get some some pads some grade pads around all that plumbing to make that a little bit easier to screed around make sure everything's nice and flat You see that slump, it moves around pretty good. You know, it's it's stiff enough to hold its shape really well, but it's loose enough to push and pull around so you don't really kill yourself. That's what the water reducer does for you. I've have I've got many videos on that. Um, I'll link one in the I'll link one down in the description so you can check out just exactly what that water reducer is in case you guys are wondering about it. Now here we are trying to get the truck up. You can see what I mean, getting him down there is okay, but because it's kind of soft gravel, getting him out is going to be uh, is going to be quite quite a bit of work. And the guy driving, Brian, he's a really really good driver. He's been driving for 30 years. It's just you know a concrete truck is different than a dump truck full of gravel, and that's what we hear a lot from the excavation guys when we question when we question the backfill. You know the excavation guys will be like, well, we've been back and our dump trucks down there all day and getting them out all right and I'll say well you know a concrete truck empty weighs more than a full dump truck um, so you can see now on these on these rear dumps both sets of back tires lock in so both sets of those tires can spin and we still can't get them out and he's not really sinking that much it's just the stuff on the surface is so soft it's not allowing him to get the traction to push himself back up over there you know so you'll see in a minute how we got him out but this is this kind of stuff we deal with on you know new construction sites quite a bit when they're when the land slopes a lot and just just running a dump truck over it isn't usually enough to pack it enough you know it's one thing too when the excavation guys are there with the dump trucks they're usually there with either the bulldozer or the excavator too so if they did get a dump truck stuck well they can just pull it out with that but when we're here they're not usually here they're on another site so we don't have the luxury of just being able to pull it out with a piece of equipment now we're gonna stop and we're gonna try to get him up there as far as we can and hope that we can pull him out with another concrete truck but we don't know yet because the stuff up above him is still kind of soft too. I mean, we don't want to get both of them stuck and then not be able to dump the full one out. O'Brien's well, just insisting that he can try to get this thing out. Tough place to get. That stuff's soft. These things are terrible in soft dirt. So, so he's going to... He's going to wet it down. We'll try to get him out. He's going to get his hose out. And he's going to try to water down that, that dirt up there to keep it from being so, like, dry and dry and powdery. And he thinks maybe if he waters that dirt down, he can get out without being pulled out. So he's going to try that. In the meantime, you know, it's, it's really, really hot this morning. It's about 7 in the morning right now. It's already, the temperature's already in the 80s. It's supposed to get close to 100 today. So we got to get the concrete pulled down. We don't want to spend too much time worrying about trying to get him out because right now we know we can get that second truck down on the other side to finish pouring if we have to. And that's really the main thing is getting the concrete off the trucks so it doesn't start setting up inside the drums it's the temperature inside that drum is a lot hotter than it is outside so we want to get the concrete off as fast as we can 
Now Darren's screeding, he's using the MBW screed demon, the battery powered one, which makes it nice. So one guy can basically run the screed while two guys rake. And that makes screeding really easy, and that allows me to go up and kind of, me and Brian are up there trying to figure out, okay, let's let's see if we can get you out, but if we can't, let's just get you up here as far as we possibly can, and then stop, and then we'll see if we can back that second truck down, maybe hook onto you with a chain and get you out. So that's kind of like the direction we're thinking of going, if, if this doesn't work. see once those back tires get into that soft stuff right there he starts what we call chattering and that's basically it he's done right there he can try to pack it by going back and forth over it but it's just not working today you see how easy that screed's working getting in. Eric and Luke are making Darren's job real easy and yeah, you get up there a little bit further they're making Darren's job easy by raking the concrete just as close to grade as they possibly can behind that screed. Yeah, Brian's not giving up. He's going to try to get that thing out. He, uh, he does not want to be pulled out because he'll know that, you know, we got a good relationship with Brian. He know he knows we're gonna tease him a little bit about getting stuck, and them guys. He doesn't like to be teased about that. So he's doing whatever he can to get that thing out. He just can't get it any more than that right there. He's gonna end up breaking something if he keeps trying that. Yep, he got out. He's had enough. So Darren's got that first section pulled down. They're gonna, they're gonna, them guys are gonna jump up there and now get this second section done. It's gonna shrink that up a little bit first. You can see it's a little thicker there in the middle of that floor. There's a part of this up front here where they didn't pour that footing, so they just thicken the slab up, and that's where a lot of the weight will sit in that thickened area. Those radiant heat tubes too. Those are like five-eighths of an inch and uh, what they're made of they're, the stuff they're made of is really really rugged you can as you can see we can put tools on them we can walk on them and I don't think as, as much as we've done this as many of these floors have we poured we've, we've ever poked a hole in one not that I can remember anyway yeah now the third truck showing up so we really want to get this first truck down and start getting stop pouring the second truck Otherwise, that third truck's going to be sitting there for quite a while, just heating up. You know, he's got to he's got to keep his drum moving, so he can't just shut his drum off. So he keeps his drum moving and spinning really, really slow. And you know, the more that thing just spins with the concrete in it, the hotter the concrete gets inside there. So we want to get this stuff down. So far, so far, it looks pretty good. What Darren, Luke, and Eric are doing there—the concrete. Doesn't look like it's starting to set up yet. Still looks pretty loose. But I just wanted to show you how easy it is to screed with that with that power screed, you know, and as long as you've got something to go by on each end, that's that's what's telling you you're flat is uh you know, you got that pad on the left and then the pad on the right, and you're watching the two ends of that screed as you as you pull it backwards. And you're just making sure what you're scoring is what we call it. I right, can't quite get him out of there, so we're gonna we're gonna hook onto him with another truck. See if we can just get him out of this soft shit. He almost made it out. Okay. Say hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. All right, here we go. See if we can get these things out of here.
All right, so as you can see, we got him out. It just took my chain. Now, I've carried a chain with me forever. You know, we have we have one in each truck, actually, just in case something like that happens. It's not really, probably could be a little bigger, honestly, because uh, I've seen him, I've seen those guys try to pull out a truck and the chain just snaps. But he wasn't stuck so bad that that chain couldn't get him out. So that's, I don't know how many times over the years that chain has saved us from having to call uh like a record truck or something most of these most of these concrete trucks that we use they don't they don't carry chains or cables with them because they don't really want to be towing each other um so i've always carried one i just thought it was a good idea it doesn't take that up that much space in the toolbox really but they do they do break on occasion so probably the best thing is really is a nice thick cable so the second truck we got down there okay and, and again we could run into the same problem with the second truck because this other side really wasn't that good either the only difference with the second truck versus the first truck is the second truck's still going to have some concrete on him so he's going to be heavier which which actually might be a bonus for him you know and not be so light in the tail end and he you know he might be able to drive right up out of there without chattering like that first truck was Again, you can see the slump there. Nice seven-inch slump with a water reducer. Um, actually, makes pouring concrete really easy. Each now, the, when we call and order concrete, you know, I'll call them whether the whether I call them the day before, or a week ahead, or even that morning of the of the job, and tell them the mix I want. I'm basically just calling him and saying, you know, his name's Dave. I go, hey Dave, I need a 3,500 psi mix with a microfiber a water reducer and air entrainment and then as far as the water reducer goes i'll tell them either i want the high range or the mid range depending on just how loose we want the slump so you can get, get up to about a six and a half seven slump with the mid range and then if you need something even looser let's say you got to pour it you got to pull it even further you can go with the high range and you could pour it even a little bit looser than this without without hurting the strength at all i mean that's basically what it's designed for and the, there is a little bit of extra charge, you know, two, three, four, five dollars a yard extra, depending on what range you use, mid range or high range. So you have to decide, you know, with a, well, let's say a ten yard load, if it's if it's three bucks extra for the mid range, is is thirty dollars per truck for ten yards? Is it worth it to be able to pour a nice loose slump like this? I know for us it is. I can tell you that for sure. And again, we're just matching top of wall. Now we do check the top of wall with the laser just to make sure the foundation guys got the top of the wall really flat and level. And if they don't, you know, we'll just adjust the floor with using our laser level, making sure the floor is nice and flat, even if it doesn't exactly match the top of the wall. And then, uh, you know, in the top of the wall, the foundation guys, they got their anchor bolts in there to, to bolt the plate down to start building the house. This will all be stick built what we call stick built so they'll probably two by sixes for walls they'll just they'll lay out all the two by sixes on the floor nail them together you know and then stand the walls up in place and that's what I mean by stick built it's not usually usually these places like this aren't prefabbed this is what we call kick screeding so Luke is just kicking in his footprints as he's screeding He's watching the end of his screed to make sure he's scoring with the previous part of the floor. And I'm over there. I got the other end. I'm just kind of trying to match his stroke, making his life as easy as possible since I'm on the outside and he's on the inside. And I'm just I'm just going right off top of wall here, what I magged over there, matching the top of the wall. So as far as my part, my part's pretty easy to screed. Luke's really doing most of the work. What we don't want to do is we don't want to fill that area entirely in in case we're a little bit high and then just have to shovel it out so we'll leave a little bit open at the end and then we'll get to you know we'll, we'll screed this down just a little bit further then figure out okay we need a couple more wheelbarrows let's just dump a couple more wheelbarrows in here and that way we can get it really close without wasting too much concrete and we know we still got the garage to do and the generator pad to do so you know we don't want to waste too much concrete down here and then run out up top there somewhere so let me know what you think so far as far as 
Um, well, how does that flow look? Does it look nice and flat to you? The bow float we run over this run, works really, really good when the slump's around six and a half, seven. You know, it's usually just down and back like Eric's going to do right here. And then we like the rounded bow float that has the rounded edges, and then that doesn't leave really big lines like some of the square end bow floats do. It doesn't seem to dig in as much on the ends. That's always All right, so, all right, so we're up here on the garage, and the spec for the plan, they didn't call for, you know, wire mesh or rebar in the garage. Usually inside a frost wall like this, the concrete's not going to go anywhere. The only thing it really could do, I guess, would be settle if the guys, if the excavator, when they filled it in, didn't pack it well enough. But most of the guys, they'll pack it in, in you know, lifts, like every six inches, they'll compact it. So that's generally not a problem with uh, a good excavator. <laughs> So we'll just use the fiber mesh reinforcement in the concrete with the 3500 PSI and we don't have any trouble with that in our garage floors like this as far as not using the wire, not using the rebar. And then we'll saw cut after we get done power trial and we always saw cut our joints to help uh, control the cracks. So even if it does crack in the saw cut like it's supposed to, it's not going to go anywhere because it's held by the it's held in by the concrete walls and then the fiber mesh does help hold it together some too I mean that's what it's designed for so the reinforcement in here you know basically all wire and rebar does is they help they do help spread the load out if you have a lot of weight on the concrete they'll help they'll help distribute the load a little bit but basically what they'll do is if something cracks and it wants to separate because of the crack it'll help hold that crack tight that's what wire and rebar is for um, it doesn't prevent it from cracking so it, it might it might help deter cracks as far as spreading a load out on it but it doesn't prevent it from cracking so it just helps basically hold those cracks together nice and tight and that the fiber mesh is, is designed kind of to do that too to help do that do especially at the surface The key is, you know, really just the compaction with the gravel and then pouring, pouring a good concrete mix. If you're going to pour loose like this, you've got to have water reducer. You wouldn't want to pour this loose without water reducer because that, that would definitely lessen the strength and you'd be more susceptible to shrinkage crackings. Pouring something this loose with just water. But without, without the water, with just the water reducer, this is still really strong, hard concrete. And it would, you know, if, if there was a cylinder test taken on this, which I have a video about cylinder tests, I can link that too for you if you want to see that. This would, you know, 3,500 PSI concrete, it would probably break, you know, 3,800, 4,000 in 30 days. This does slope to a couple inches from the back of the front. That's why there's no... There's no floor drain in here. Most of the garages that we do don't have a floor drain. We slope them out the front a little bit. And then when they have radiant heat in them like this, if, if you do heat the floor, I mean, they may or may not even need to use the heat in the floor in the garage. But if they do decide to use it, if the concrete's warm and you do get water on the floor, it's going to pretty much just evaporate the water anyway. But we still, we always like to put a little slope on stuff. You know, if you drive in a garage with your car and it's wet or if you got snow and ice melting off it, you definitely don't want the water to work its way towards the back of the garage or just puddle under the door where you have to get out of the car. You kind of want it to run towards the door. So that's that's why we slope most of our garages right out the front. And pouring something loose like this, a six and a half, seven slump with, uh, let's say, a a two or three inch pitch out the front that that doesn't bother that doesn't bother this at all this you can you know if it was six inches of pitch or seven or eight <laughs> then you might not want to pour it quite this loose but having just like a two inch slope you're not even going to be able to tell
and when we do when we do screed a slope we generally still screed it by hand we could use the power screed here but you know the power screed is kind of vibrating the concrete if you vibrate something with a slope it's going to want to tend to sag towards the lower part of the slope versus if you screed it by hand like this you're not vibrating it so it'll you'll tend to get a little bit truer slope though we just like to screed it by hand this is how we were taught to screed anyway before even all these power screeds and vibra screeds came out we were screeding like this so it's not like this is new to us at all again it's really hot here today it's it's middle of summer in Maine and if you're wondering if we do get hot temperatures we do we get temps in the hundreds we get really high humidity 100% humidity sometimes for uh, it could be quite a stretch in the summer you know most of July most of August and then about September temperatures start to cool a little bit and things get really really nice as far as working temperatures for most of September and quite a bit of October and then usually the start of November you know you could have a 70 degree day and then at the end of November you could have snow so November is a big change as far as weather goes for us and then the days start getting really short too in November we'll have once they turn the clocks back you know the the Sun will come up at oh 6 30 in the morning and it'll be dark by 4 4 30 in the afternoon so you don't have a heck of a lot of working time like like you do in the summer and then about november 15th most of the concrete companies that have that have the ability to to heat the water will start putting warm water in the concrete so, some will do it a little bit before depending on if the temperatures get below freezing at night before november 15th you know they'll crank on the boiler and you might get 70 80 90 degree water in the in the mixing and drum of the truck and then from november 15th usually to april 15th they start charging for warm water so five six seven bucks a yard extra and then they'll crank the temperatures up depending on how cold it is you could get 100 degree water you could get 110 degree water you know kind of just depends on how cold it is outside that's when you know so you got 110 degree water in the in the in the truck and by the time they mix that water with the with the aggregate you know and the cement and the sand the concrete's coming out of the chute probably you know in the high 60s maybe even around 70 degrees sometimes but if it lets if you if that truck sits in the drum with heated water then it really starts heating up and getting hot and you could have a hard time screed and pulling that stuff down if it sits in there too much but um, that's typically how it goes in Maine so four seasons and it's just a different type of concrete in every single season that that we have to work with and sometimes it can be a struggle probably the toughest the toughest season part of the season is when the ground is cold so you're pouring on really cold ground there's no there's no hot water in the concrete yet so this is like early fall and also early spring so the ground is really cold the concrete's cold and the Sun is coming up and it's a little windy then the concrete starts acting really really weird on sometimes and it can be really hard to finish So now we're just all working together to get this down by now it's uh, probably around 8 o'clock in the morning right now good thing is the garage is mostly in the shade still as you can see the the Sun is still behind the trees that can kind of give you an idea how early it is in the morning <laughs> it's not up very high yet You always strike those doorways just to make sure it's nice and nice and flat across the door. You never know when the form you put on could have just a little bit of a dip or a hump in it, even if it's a quarter inch. Um, that's going to be an issue with 
the door once they install the door then it wants to sit down flat on that there could be a gap under the rubber nothing worse than having a brand new floor with a with a dip in it right in the doorway Darren here, he's in the white shirt, and that's me over there screeding on the other end. He's just, you know, when, when you got a guy on the inside and a guy on the outside like this, the guy on the outside is just trying to make life as easy as possible for the guy on the inside. So he's just matching my speed, my stroke, and just making, making sure he doesn't get ahead of me, making my life as easy as possible for me in there. Just a few tips from guys that screed the way we screed like this. We like to keep that screed kind of tipped on the back edge too. We don't like the front edge cutting in on it. That way it doesn't rip and tear the concrete as much open as we screed. And then that makes bowl floating it easier. You can see how it all fills in pretty nice around all the aggregate. That's going to make bowl floating real easy. So we just keep it slightly tilted on the back edge. You can kind of tell right there how it's tilted just a little bit and then that makes screeding really really easy and basically you know Eric and Darren are puddling now their, their job is to make sure it's not low or too high but definitely not low because we don't want to stop once we get going we don't want to stop until we have to the less bending over and standing up we have to do the better And then we want to make sure that when we finish up in front of a door, that's really nice and flat there. And then we'll just get that bowl floated smooth. And then here's a little generator pad. They actually set this up themselves. Um, so this is just an extra. They were like, well, if you got any extra concrete, can you throw it in this pad for us? We're going to put a generator here. And then we'll, you know, we'll dig a line to the house. We'll have it underground and underground wire to the house to set the generator on. So we were like, yeah, sure. We'll just pour it for you. If we get, sure, we'll have enough concrete left over we usually order between half a yard and a yard extra just to make sure we don't run out so this is basically what a little generator pad looks like you know they they use two by sixes they use metal pins to set it they squared it screwed it in place set it to grade and then we don't even really need a screed on this we can just mag right off top of the forms get it get it nice and flat and level and then we did end up coming back after it set up a little bit. We run an edger around it and we just magged it out nice and smooth and just put a light broom finish on it. And then that was it for that. Oh, there, everything's done. We got the garage done. House is done. Got a power trout. Gonna drive fast today. Supposed to be about 98 today. So it must be, I don't know what time, it must be about 8.30 right now. I bet we'll be out of here before noon today. I'll power trial and sod. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one. All right, so this is a sneak look inside the concrete underground where I have multiple trainings, multiple different categories on how I teach you how to pour and finish concrete, how to repair concrete, how to do epoxy coatings, there's just multiple different trainings where I go in depth and teach you how to do all this stuff.